My name is Ron Levy. I'm an applied mathematician and a faculty member here at the Technion's math department. Today I will talk about research in deep learning and its mathematical foundations. Join me for the full conversation with Elia Turner, a PhD student here at the faculty. Hi Ron, how are you? Great, how are you? I'm great, thanks. Tell me a bit about your research. I'm an applied mathematician, and this means that I like to come up with theorems and prove them, but I, I'm also interested in science and technology. So maybe we can talk today about one topic that interests me, deep learning and its mathematical foundations. Can you define formally what deep learning is? Okay, yeah, that's a good point, because there's actually no conventional definition of what deep learning is. So in deep learning, we learn algorithms or models from data. Okay, so, so to do different tasks. Okay, the task can be, for example, to classify images, to say if there is a dog, cat, or anything else that you want to detect in the image. It can be to do language translation. It can be to generate molecules with desired properties, like antibacterial molecules. So there, there are many, many different tasks. I like to think about a deep learning model as an algorithm. Let me explain what this means. You know that a traditional algorithm is designed by a person, and all of the fine details of the algorithm are chosen in advance to achieve the goal of the algorithm. Now, on the other hand, you can think about deep learning as the practice of designing algorithms by laying out the general structure of the algorithm, or what we call the architecture. So you choose the different types of computations to be used and their order, but you keep many parameters free. And these three parameters are not chosen by hand, they are automatically optimized by a computer. Okay, so in the optimization, you, you force the algorithm to do what it's supposed to do on some data that is given to you. And, and this is what is called learning or, or training. So what is the advantage of keeping these parameters free? Th that's a good question. The idea is to admit to ourselves that we are not smart enough to fully understand how to solve the problem. Okay, because it's too difficult. These are problems that nobody even, even came close to, to solving before the deep learning revolution. So instead what we do is we come up with general purpose algorithms wh where you have many degrees of freedom, which are the, the trainable parameters. And how do you tune or train these parameters? Okay, so let me give the example of image classification. So in what is called supervised learning, somebody provides you with many example images and the correct class corresponding to each image. Okay, they tell you this is a cat, this is a dog, and so on. And now you sort of cheat. Because you say, I don't really know how to mathematically define what an image is, and I don't know how to define what, what property an image needs to satisfy in order to belong to some class. Okay, and this means that I cannot define a formula that takes an algorithm and takes a generic image, and the formula tells you how accurate the algorithm is, because I don't have a definition for a generic image. So instead what we do is we focus only on the examples from the training set. So we choose the three parameters of the algorithm in such a way that guarantees that the algorithm does what it's supposed to do specifically for the images in the training set. Okay, this is training. So if I can summarize that in one sentence, it would be deep learning equals a general purpose algorithm plus tons of data. Exactly, that, that's a good summary. And you're hoping that, assuming you have the training set, it captures all the statistical properties of a natural image so that if your algorithm was only trained on these training examples, it would be able to generalize to unseen data. Yes, definitely. Cool. So there is, is there a way to guarantee that that would work? Yeah, that's actually a very, very good question. It's like in the core of machine learning. It's like the holy grail of questions. It's called generalization. The ability of the algorithm to perform well on new examples that you haven't seen during training. Okay, so there's, there's currently no uh, simple and complete answer to this problem, and many people are trying to, to, to work on this and trying to understand it theoretically from different points of view, inc including myself. Um, and there are many, many different uh, interesting explanations. So this is a very active field of research. Cool. Can you elaborate more about where do you fit into the research? What is a contribution that you've made to the learning theory field? So one thing I'm working on is deep learning on graphs. So here the objects that you want to classify or operate on in any other way 
are graphs. Okay, the idea is that often data is not defined over regular domains, like images defined over grids, but it's defined as a graph. For example, molecules can be seen as graphs where the nodes are atoms and the edges represent chemical bonds. Okay, social networks, for example, are graphs where nodes are people and edges represent some interaction between the people, like friendship. Surfaces can be discretized as graphs or, or meshes. So there are many examples, and all of them are very useful and practical. So you can imagine how much attention deep learning on graphs receives from the, both from the industry and the academy these days. So how do you go about studying generalization in such a complex and full of free parameters objects as graphs? OK, so let, let me draw an analogy to numerical analysis. So in numerical analysis, the objects that we study are discrete entities, but usually there is a continuous model that the discrete model approximates. Okay, maybe you have an example? I would say that grids approximate continuous rectangles or that meshes approximate continuous uh, surfaces. Yeah. If you look at the discrete entity, it looks very complicated and intricate. However, the continuous limit of the discrete entity actually captures more regular, uh, large-scale phenomenon. And this is the, the thing that we are interested in numerical analysis, right? Because we want to study how to approximate computations on continuous models. And this means that all of the fine details of the discrete model shouldn't affect the numerical scheme if it is to be useful for us. OK, so now let's, let's take it back to our uh, discussion on graphs. So graphs, like social networks, for example, are also very complicated and intricate entities. However, you can actually show that there is a natural limit object also for graphs. And this is called the graphon. What is a graphon? So this is the story. There is a way to define a metric on the space of all graphs that somehow describes a meaningful, meaningful notion of, of distance or similarity between graphs. OK, now. You can show that if you take the completion of this metric space, you get a compact metric space, and the limit objects in this, metric sp in this compact space are sort of graphs with a continuous node set. OK, so it's like continuous graphs, and these are called graphons. Now, once you have these continuous graphs at hand, you can start to do approximation theory, like it's done in numerical analysis. So, you can start analyzing how graph algorithms operate on these continuous graphs and how properties are preserved when discrete graphs approximate continuous graphs. And eventually, this leads naturally to a generalization analysis. OK, so let me see if I understand. You are trying to understand and study complex discrete graphs. So instead, you move and study their continuous counterparts, which are the graphons which are simpler and more regular and are easier to study. You prove theorems about the continuous domain, and then you also have to show that these theorems are still valid when you return to the discrete original graphs. Yeah, that's a very good way to sum it up. Oh, that sounds really cool. So before we wrap up, do you have any funny math joke that you want to share? OK. So two mathematicians work on a proof. Mathematician A thinks that some step in the, in the proof is trivial and can be omitted, and mathematician B doesn't agree. It doesn't look trivial to him. So they get into an argument, okay, and, and it, it's, the argument is not resolved. That evening, when mathematician B goes home, he starts to, th to think about this step in the proof. Is it trivial? Why is it trivial? So he starts to write uh, various derivations, and he writes proof after proof, filling page after page. He works all night long. OK, so the next day, after only a couple, a couple of hours of sleep, mathematician B goes to the university. Uh, so he goes to the office of mathematician A with all of his notes, and he tells them, you are correct. It is trivial. So what would be the lesson behind that joke? OK, so, so you know that uh, mathematics is pure and exact, but the art of developing mathematics is enigmatic. It is obscure. Well, that's such a powerful way to end this interview. Uh, Ron, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me as well. Mm -hmm.